everybody. Um, talking from a Geneva satellite station of, of GGI. And I'm, uh, I'm Francesco Riva, and I'm very happy to introduce uh, Sasha Ziboedov. Um, he's a uh, faculty at CERN now. And uh, well, you will see, he's an expert on uh, analyticity of the S matrix, or whatever he's going to be teaching about. Uh, Don't uh, hesitate to interrupt as many times as you want, please. Uh, he will be very happy of this and, and ask questions. Well, thank, you, thank you very much, Francesco. Hi, everyone. Um, and uh, I would like, of course, to thank the organizers for uh, organizing the school and for the opportunity to speak here. Of course, I was very much looking forward to being in Florence, but well, let's, let's try to do the best out of it. Um, let me say we'll start with a few comments. First of all, uh, yes, there are for this for this course there are lecture notes. I will upload them, I guess, to the Slack channel as organizers prefer. I guess I will upload them there later today, so you can um, you can check uh, check them check them out there. There is effectively that's the plan of the course. I will, don't know how much I will be able to cover, but uh, I think. Uh, yeah, that's that would be should be useful for you in case you, you miss something or you want to see some details. Please check it there. Uh, second second comment is that uh, I happened to give this course like a month ago. Exactly, it's probably on YouTube. Uh, it's like, so I think for for if you if you missed the lecture or uh, or you already attended this course, and I think organizer said it's mandatory for students, but I think this other course should count for this course. If some of you has attended, don't feel obliged to listen to it again. Uh, yes, and finally, to, to make it uh, more interesting, both for me and for you, I encourage you, please uh, just don't hesitate and ask questions. Um, I think it would be great if we have more keep it as informal uh, as possible. Now, uh, the topic of the course was uh, is analytic uh, S matrix. Uh, in fact, I don't remember how it ended up this title. I don't think I understand it. I think maybe Francesca already knew what we're talking about. But uh, for some of you who, uh, who haven't heard that, it's, it's a little bit, uh, might be a strange title. So let me let me explain a little bit. And uh, in other words, another word, another title for the course, we can call it the S matrix bootstrap. Uh, reduction to the S matrix bootstrap. And uh, the Notion of S matrix so today in the morning already was introduced by uh, by Simone in a beautiful lecture, and so in the course we will be uh, talking uh, about the scattering of relativistic particles. This is the main talk, and we will be interested in transition amplitudes. Now the key word for uh, for my course. Uh, will be uh, the word non perturbative and already today in the, in the, in the in, in today's in the morning uh, during the lecture um, I, I haven't seen the second part I couldn't attend it but in the first part there was there was a some little exercise where we first derived we first discussed quickly the unitarity of the s matrix was then you asked to, to check an example, and uh, you might have noticed that uh, the first notion that the S matrix is unitary and uh, that the probability is whatever is conserved is non perturbative, it's very general. But then when you did the computation, you check it just the leading order in the coupling constant, whatever that it was introduced. So, and this is uh, uh, the general, uh, this is a general thread in many quantum field theory books. When you consider scattering of relativistic particles, you can discuss this uh, basic principles, the general things like probability is concerned. But usually when, when we do the calculations, then we do the uh, 
say, calculation with finite diagrams, we check it only perturbatively. And uh, the, in this course, I will try to, so and I, I assume like this, if you want to learn about perturbative quantum field theory, it's a beautiful subject. Then uh, there is a, we can use Feynman diagrams to compute amplitudes. And, and of course there are also non-perturbative aspects to that. But in this course, I'll just try to focus on those general, general basic, uh, basic principles, which, uh, Which underlies, uh, which underlies relativistic scattering, and because they're so basic, we expect that them to be non perturbatively true. And so we will be asking, first of all, uh, the question number one, which I will be interested in this course, is what are these basic principles? What are these basic principles? And I hope. Second question, how to use them to get uh, some mileage to physicists to do some computation. That would be the spirit. I, I hope that uh, Im imagine that we we all let's say read the uh, Schwartz or Peskin Schroeder, and we have an idea already about scattering. Uh, but uh, in fact, in the oftentimes we do it perturbatively. And in, in this course, I hope this will be complementary to the standard textbooks, and uh, we will discuss some non-perturbative basic principles and some techniques to uh, to use them, which are usually not so maybe in detail discussing these standard textbooks. Now, why, why is it an interesting topic? Or well, what, what is the basic idea? Why, why are we talking about this? And what is the history of the subject? So today, yeah, today the lecture will be introductory. I think it's important to get this basic picture right and then or to have it in some form. And then, uh, because then the technical part, you will be able to follow so why 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 are we doing that and why are the questions why are we asking this question so the first the first thing is that um, one of the greatest discovery of say 20th century physics we can say is that if when we combine uh, special relativity and uh, in quantum mechanics, we get, uh, well, you can say we get quantum field theory, but uh, let me write that we get certain rigidity. Uh, we can call it happiness. What, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean by that if you take two, if you take Newton's uh, mechanics, if you have two bodies, you can postulate whatever force you like write whatever potential you like and study it. So it looks completely, there is nothing, nothing to say more about it. However, what uh, people discussed is that when we try to combine uh, special relativity and quantum mechanics in a consistent way, in fact, if the structures that you get is very, is, is quite robust, it's, uh, by, by robust, I mean, it's, it's a long, I guess, story, but effectively it's, uh, you cannot write whatever you want. Say, you know, sometimes if, uh, uh, if you try to, uh, for example, introduce a mass to a vector particle, you're forced to a Higgs mechanism. If you try to introduce graviton, you're forced into general relativity. Um, I mean, not, how much force is, is a subtle question, but the basic idea is that it's a non trivial task. And in fact, sometimes this task famously has not been solved, even if you take, if you add here plus gravity, we don't even know, uh, always we don't know how to combine these things. And this is an extreme example where by combining, even just trying to combine the basic principles, 
well, we have a string theory, and uh, but in general, we it, it, it's a uh, it's a hard task. And so this is this idea of rigidity and bootstrappiness. It's very it's it's old. It was already observed uh, in the fifties when the subject of S matrix came to prominence. I guess uh, the concept was famously introduced in the forties by Heisenberg and uh, who wanted to reformulate everything in terms of relativistic observables, things which you can actually measure. And the S matrix is, is the object that we are talking about in particle physics. And uh, then uh, people, when they realize this, this rigidity is they start contemplating the idea that maybe in fact, that's it. Just that's the end of physics. You just try to combine these things and you are done. That's the only way. And so, and this program was called the program of bootstrap. And uh, in its uh, extreme form, it was formulated in the 60s by Jeffrey Chu, which, which who famously said that the nature is as it is because it's the only nature that is consistent with itself. Because if the nature makes sense, that's you're done. We, we find the theory, and, and this, this idea, even though it has proven to be wrong. And we know that, uh, say, there are many quantum field theories. There are probably many theories of quantum gravity. But the basic idea is correct that if you try to combine that uh, these basic principles, it's a non trivial task and you can get the mileage on it. Now, in the old days, in the in the 50s or in the 60s, people tried to solve QCD before QCD was invented using these methods, and they failed to develop a computational scheme, uh, which is reliable, and then QCD was discovered, so the, the program was um, essentially abandoned. So sometimes you can hear the words that this metric bootstrap has failed. It, it, did, it did fail to produce some reliable way to solve QCD, but the basic idea was uh, was correct, and in fact, uh, now after whatever 80 years, 60 years, sorry, uh, people are coming back to it. So I'm, I'm talking about it today because in the last few years, in the last 10, uh, even five, seven years, there was a lot of a lot of work and a lot of uh, ideas put into trying to resurrect this program. Now, what? Uh, What's the reason? What's the reason for that? Let me, let me mention a few. So, well, first of all, um, there is a, originally this program was to attempt to solve QCD, but after 60 years, there is an example where this program was realized uh, quite fully. And this is uh, this is an instant of, uh, ADSCT as a formal bootstrap. If you have never heard about it, let me say a few words. So ADSCT is a it's an answer to question number one uh, in the context of quantum gravity, which we put in a gravitational box. So ADS stands for antimatter space. It's a, it's how you build a gravitational box. So you can think of it as a tin can, which you pinch from the boundary, and then things scatter in the bulk. So in fact, uh, ADS, this ADS stands for gravitational theory, which lives inside this box. And uh, we are studying exactly the same type of S matrix elements, but instead of pinching a theory in the far past and asking what comes out in the far future, like we do for the S matrix, where we have there is some incoming, incoming particles, P1, P2, P4. Here we, we, we can consider the boundary of the space and uh, study this, say, what happens if you kick, kick the system a little bit and how the relations work. And the ads CFT states that the answer, the basic principles of the gravitational theory in the bulk are the axioms of conformal field theory. So it's a set of axioms which you can write down. And moreover, then uh, people also realized in the last 15 years that if you take these basic axioms of CET, you can 
put them on the computer, and in fact, uh, get some mileage and sometimes even solve the theory in some sense. So the famous example is that you put the axioms on a computer and you you can pinpoint very well 3D Ising models. So. And as you see, it's exactly the idea is exactly is exactly like this. And so uh, after we after we now established this, uh, we have the success story. We can try to go back to this original S matrix bootstrap and try to revisit uh, this program and try to try to do to to get some mileage out of it. And the, the basic idea, so again. Um, Acting this lecture by Simone, he he wrote this nice uh, nice uh, uh, three three ways to think about uh, proton proton collision, how theorists think, then how phenomenologists and experimentalists think about that. And uh, the, the first starting point of a theorist was uh, was uh, a Feynman diagram. But I think we, we, so what in this course, what we should do is that to go theorist square. So we go theorist square and we will understand that we will think that, in fact, this Feynman diagram, it's just a tip, it's a perturbative tip of some, some non perturbative theory. And then we would like to understand, in fact, how do you embed this, this Feynman diagram, which by itself is fine, but by looking at it, it's not at all clear that it's a consistent quantum mechanical theory. Again, non perturbatively, because uh, um, because Feynman, Feynman graphs from the from the point of view of S matrix bootstrap, Feynman graphs and Lagrangians is just a machine which implements basic principles. Like that's what Feynman diagrams do. They 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 solve unitarity. They compute cross sections, order by order, and perturbation theory. But we are asking the question about non perturbative And so why is it, why it might be useful? Why you should care about it? Uh, well, one potential thing is that uh, whenever we do experiments and we do some theoretical work in uh, say particle physics, we, we think in terms of energy <coughs> and uh, the theories we know that they are low energy theories. So as we, as our colliders get better, we know the theory better and better at slightly higher energies, but there is always a cutoff with it. We know the theory up to a certain energy, and then we don't know. And so, and then we 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 can ask what is uh, what comes next as we increase the energy if we build larger collider. What is uh, you know, what is a set of possibilities? And uh, one way you can go about it, you can start writing say try to write some models try to come up with some models and uh, try to uh, study these models but that, there is uh, another way to think about this problem and uh, this is what is known as a say bootstrap philosophy where you're not trying to you're not trying to guess what the theory is but instead you try to bound your ignorance like we are not trying like to guess the equations of motion like Albert Einstein did, but we are trying to show what is the set of possibilities uh, which is ruled out. And what I mean by that is that we take IR and uh, IR, I mean, you can take a standard model plus uh, you can take lambda CD and everything we know about, everything we know about physics this is an IR. This we already know. That's done. And then we can ask: Well, what happens if we if we combine it with basic principles? Is it even consistent to to uh, to construct a theory which has loops in the IR like this and uh, satisfies the basic principle? So if you manage to do that, that's an that's an option. It could be that we build a collider and we discover this theory. So this, this uh, two things, if you combine them, it, it gives you set of set of UV.
they uh, for Jeffrey Chu, he he thought that if you look at the spectrum of hadrons and mesons and you combine it with basic basic principles, you fix the theory. People who are working on maybe a swamp land and on quantum gravity, they think that after you combine IR plus basic principles, you get string theory. We don't know. It's it's an interesting question. What 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 uh, what you do? And I think the exciting fact about uh, our our situation today that this question, which is in principle, okay, to to know what are the next particles, we need a new collider. But to to play these games of combining IR plus basic principles, you don't need a collider. It's a theorist. It's a theorist task. We are agnostic about the UV, and we want to understand what comes in. And so this is a theorist task to understand what is the set of the UV possibilities. And surprisingly, surprisingly, in 2022, last time I gave this lecture, I said at this point 2021, uh, 2022, this question has not been answered. So if you take, if you if you ask, has anyone looked, took a standard model, combined it with non-perturbative basic principles, and tried to derive some bootstrap bounds? This hasn't been done, so that's that's exciting, I think, because it says that we have a work to do, and that's uh, that's uh, the motivation for for these lectures and for the recent developments where people managed to get uh, new results uh, by playing these games of combining something we know, maybe with basic principles, and uh, and so here you see that. Of course, we have to we have to know the IR and for all these things we, we need to learn, but it's also useful to learn these basic principles and sometimes have them in mind that even when we do the Feynman diagram computations and we do the some perturbative estimates, which might work really well, in the back of our mind there is always a non-perturbative theory which uh, which is at, at work and at place, and just sometimes we uh, we cannot do that. And, and I think it's also fair to say that um, many questions, or some sometimes you are lucky maybe, but many questions, on, and the most interesting questions are related to relativistic quantum field theory are non-perturbative in nature. So the phenomena which are usually can be most mysterious are non-perturbative, and sometimes maybe if you are lucky, you can address this non-perturbative things, but I think it's fair to say that in general, this in quantum field theory and, and quantum gravity, we do not have a good, good non-perturbative ways to think about this problem. And in fact, this is the only way. So if you wish, what was what is uh, what is Feynman graphs for perturbation theory, the bootstrap methods which I am talking about is for non-perturbative theory. So ideally, you want to put everything together and to know as much as you can. But that's that's a philosophy. So now, uh, okay, and uh, yes, let me emphasize that while while this this is not was known, say to maybe this was popular in the fifties. Now, with the advent of idea CFT and conformal bootstrap and this matrix bootstrap got a new life, and this is something which is actively being actively developed now. So in the in my lecture. Notes you can find a set of literature, set of books. Uh, many of these books are very old and might be hard to read, but I hope that together we will, after this lectures, it will be also easier um, to do that if, if you are interested. And, uh, and also, I put some marks. Uh, there are other lectures, courses, if you are interested in working on it, uh, you, can, you can check it out. So, these are the general general things and uh, so the plan plan of my course would be that I will start with uh, some introduction and okay the historical introduction and but I will discuss a toy model. Also known as a signal model, which introduces many of these concepts uh, in, a, in a, some nice setting. Uh, 
then we will discuss some basic uh, relativistic mathematics. Clarity. Powerful wave expansion. Then uh, we will discuss the core. So you can, at this point, you ask, okay, basic principles, basic principles. What are those basic principles? And uh, the basic principles that we will be talking in this course are unitarity, which you already heard about today in the morning. And then we will have analyticity. This are the basic basic things, and uh, uh, so after introducing some basic kinematics and discussing unitarity, we will switch to um, analyticity and crossing. Here, uh, the important this is really the core, I would say, especially this is the core of S matrix theory. And uh, here, we might discuss what is known as axiomatic electricity. Uh, So uh, this is uh, uh, this is uh, the answer would be in this lecture the answer to the to the first question what are the basic principles this are the basic principles of unitarity analyticity and crossing and as you will say that uh, you will see that this analyticity is is not still an open problem in some sense and then uh, to Uh, to answer the question number two, how do we do some interesting computations of how we get some results? I will introduce dispersion relations. And here the, the key words you might some of the some of the words uh, you might want to know is uh, subtractions. Maybe we'll discuss now constraints. What is wrong? Uh, super convergence. Maybe bound on chaos. Finally, <clears throat> if time permits. We will discuss uh, some versions of non perturbative bootstraps. So, non perturbative schemes to do the computations, which people are discussing now. So, you can do this non perturbative computation both analytically and numerically. So this is uh, um, this is my plan, and uh, I have to, to 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 make two disclaimers, which you already which which are important. First, which you, you might say there will be two two elephants in the room. The first is that we know that we have a, we live in the universe with a positive cosmological constant, and my lectures will take place in flat space. 
And uh, since I'm talking about basic principles and non perturbative physics, you might say, okay, well, if you want, then you should formulate the basic principles in the universe with positive cosmological constant. And uh, I don't know what these basic principles are. And uh, in fact, we believe that we have some, some idea of how to formulate these things for uh, lambda less or equals than zero, lambda being cosmological constant. And then when it's negative, we are back to ADS CT. And when it's zero, we are back to the asymmetric bootstrap. So I will keep myself as close as possible to our universe and assume that, like we do when we do the experiments at LHC, that uh, in fact that this positive cosmological constant can be ignored. We can do the bootstrap analysis and bootstrap computations, ignoring it. So that's one thing. And that would be great to, to understand, of course, what precisely is the role of this, how to, how to do it, but it's the biggest, one of the biggest problems of how to formulate these consistency conditions as basic principles for, for this universe. Now, the second disclaimer is that, as also was mentioned today in the lecture, and uh, t equals four, we have IR divergences. So IR divergences, in a sense, it's they are they are not real. They are not true divergences. It's IR divergences is a statement that is is just the idea that when we when we when we talk about the S metrics, we imagine an experiment where we prepare a state in the far past, then the state evolves, particles collide, and we go to the far future. In the S metrics. In S metric theory and in this uh, in this lectures as well, we will assume that the state of the system, the asymptotic state of the system, is given by a set of free particles. And the basic intuition is that as particles separate, the interaction between them decays, and then we can completely characterize the initial and final states by a set of free particles. Now, in the presence of uh, in the presence of uh, uh, electromagnetic and gravitational interactions. You have to. You, you have. Yes, there is a question, right? Yeah, sorry. Can you read aloud point four? Apparently, it's not very readable. Sorry. Yes, yes, yes. It, it is not very readable even from here. So it's uh, dispersion relations. And here there are subtractions, null constraints, superconvergence, and bound and chaos. But you should not worry too much because it's in the lecture notes. You will find it in the lecture notes, but dispersion relations, subtractions, null constraints, superconvergence, and bound and chaos. And at the moment, these are just words which uh, are not even in the dictionary. So, <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry about that. Um, yes, uh, IR divergences. So, um, this is a this idea that we are talking about three asymptotic particles, it is uh, it's fine, but when you when you have a, a massless field, if when you have an electromagnetic and gravitational field, the, the particle, the free particle, does not really make sense because particle carries Coulomb field or gravitational field. So even you know the metric around the electron will be the one of the uh, charged whatever charged black hole because it has a mass that gravitates in the same. It has a Coulomb field, and just when we do the computation with amplitudes, um, we often pretend that it's not the case, and we just treat them the particles as if the uh, entities which for which the Coulomb field can be ignored, and this leads to IR divergences. So IR divergence is just a statement that we do not treat asymptotic states properly, and <clears throat> there are various ways to deal with this. So one way is uh, is what uh, um, Imona mentioned today in, the, in his lecture is that you start uh, going to some inclusive uh, observables where this higher divergence is effectively canceled and you're talking about cross sections and that's what we often do. However, this, this way of dealing with higher divergences is not, 
is not very well uh, combines not very well with this bootstrap philosophy because you know here you really want to impose unitarity and you want to impose analyticity and you want to impose crossing and you want to impose all these things at the level of amplitudes not at the level of cross sections and therefore uh, you would like to in principle reformulate all these things that we will be talking about for the some kind of properly defined four dimensional amplitudes where electrons carry their Coulomb fields and their gravitational fields, but this has not been done. So this is another bizarre fact that uh, even though the subject is so old, uh, this, this idea of the basic principles, when you try to combine it with, it, when you put it in four dimensions, we do not really have a good way to do that. Even though conceptually there is no problem, it's just a, it's just an IR physics, which we're supposed to understand really well, but somehow we don't understand it well enough. And so here you might hear the words of something like dressed states. Um, or you can hear the words for the foolish states. This is just the different ways to go from bare electrons to electron with its Coulomb field or with its gravitational field. So these are, of course, both of these things are super important and I encourage everyone to solve these problems. Uh, I hope uh, at least number, uh, number one, no one knows. But number two, I hope in the next few years, this should be solved and we really can take standard model with gravity, put everything we know from the experiment, put the basic principles and predict new particles. So that's uh, that's my uh, my general set of comments and uh, historical remarks. So maybe now is a good uh, point to ask questions. If there are any questions about the general philosophy and uh, um, yes. I might have a question since yes. I'm here. Um, why is D equal four so special? I mean, you, you mentioned infrared ravages is only in D equal four. Yeah. What is it special about D equal four that doesn't happen in the from context? Mm. Yeah, just for, for let me say something simple and then I come back to this question. That first of all, uh, yes, what Francesco is also questions imply that in fact, if you consider P reason D larger than four, say uh, five, six, or four plus two epsilon, which, which, which is what dimensional regularization does, then uh, there are no infrared divergences. This is just a fact. Amplitudes are finite. And, uh, now, why is it that there are divergences in, uh, in the D equals four? It's, um, well, the, there's, there is no enough space for 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 Coulomb field somehow. It's uh, it, uh, there is no uh, so if, if you think about phase space a lot or um, available phase space or the space where where the Coulomb field dispersed, it's there is not enough dimension so that uh, it's quite strong and it decays just it does not decay too fast as you go to infinity. So. It's, uh, it's simply the fact that you take the Gauss law and uh, we, uh, we look at the field of the electron and we see that in, in four dimensions, uh, famously, they have say the, the Coulomb field uh, decays with the same power as radiation does. It's some basic fact about wave mechanics in four dimensions. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's manifests itself in many ways. For example, if you go to four dimensional gravity, there are these PMS symmetries, which is also the statement that the both the Coulomb field and the radiation field, as you go to infinity, they decay with the same power of one over distance. Um, if you do the computations in particle physics, you take the amplitude. Uh, if you have uh, exchange of mass of particle, uh, so this is a final graph, you have a pool. And then, as you as you if you say want to compute a cross section from it, you take the square, 
and then you say integrate over the phase space, and then effectively you, you get that just the phase space is such the, the, the higher the higher is dimension here, the more dense soft and collinear divergences that come from here, and it's from four dimensions, it does not dampen. Uh, uh, well enough. So yeah, it's that's a uh, way to say it, but maybe there is also one way to th think about it, even though it's is, is maybe that there are more symmetries. If, you, if, if one way maybe to think about it, that if you think about the asymptotic symmetries, but this is not the usual symmetries, but if you go to infinity and uh, again, you see, like we see enhancement of conformal symmetry in two dimensions from global conformal to Verasora. When we look at the asymptotic symmetries, uh, we see some enhancement from Poincaré to BMS, even though in the modern treatment, BMS is present in all dimensions, but historically for, for the same reason, BMS symmetry was uh, BMS is one dimension and sucks. It's the same asymptotic symmetry of flat space, rotational theory is flat space. It was discovered in four dimensions. But it's a, it's a, I feel that I didn't give a good answer. No, it was <laughs> but I, it's just because I need to think myself more <laughs> about, about it. Yeah. There's another question by Omar. You can, um, you can speak. By the way, if, uh, if you raise your hand and nobody tells you anything, you, you can just unmute yourself. Uh, go on. Uh, we don't hear you, but perhaps it's a problem. He can't. Can't speak. Says he can't. In the chat or? Uh, he, he, he says that in the chat. Oh, the mic is the mic is turned off for, for mm -hmm. everyone. Try now. Great. Do you hear me? Yes. Now we can hear you. Good. Good. Okay. Well, my question is: in the question you have in the in the blackboard, in yeah, the the big one. So you have you take the current theories, and then you take this set of basic principles that you are expecting to have in. Let's say in the in the UV theory. That's right. Yeah. And my question is, the standard model, for example, of particle physics, is known to have some issues. Let's say, in lambda CDM, probably too. So, does taking this uh, theories as a starting point doesn't it restrict the possible UV theories that you would obtain? Because these theories are uh, have issues. So, if you take them as a basic uh, starting point. They might, uh, let's say, constrain the set of possible UV theories you will get, and that might be an issue, I guess. Well, that's. I think that's good news. That's exactly what. Uh, the more, the more, uh, the more tension you have with basic principles, the more mileage you might hope to get from that, and um, eventually, uh, that's. Uh, If we just, you know, if we just take, if we just don't know anything about the IR, the set of possibilities is more. But then, the more, the more you know about the IR, the more tension is to basic principles. It's it's good news for this because because if you believe that whatever comes after whatever UV completes this theories, still satisfies the basic principles, then the, just the set of possibilities narrows down, and this is good news for 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 people who would like to pursue this. This direction. So I would say, if you have attention, or there is some, if there is some uh, issues with, it, with it no, our known IR models, it 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 will be resolved. And of course, we believe that it will be resolved in the consistent with the, with the basic principles. And the more tension we have, the better. So ideally, maybe ideally, if there is so much tension that the UV theory is you know uniquely fixed, then we don't even need experimentalists anymore. We just solve it from consistency and we are done. But I think at the moment, of course, no one believes this is to be the case. Uh, presumably, even uh, just in, in general, physics will always will be statements about islands of possibilities. It will never be about points because we know something, but there is always some uncertainty. And 
especially when we go to the UV, we always might we, we always might just end with some islands say that okay this is a set of possibilities and just we we can all build experiments to you know, probe them more i don't know but this is i think just from the point of view of how we are obtaining knowledge that's that's the most probable outcome that we will always have just this narrow islands or wide islands of options yeah uh, i have a question about the ir divergences again uh why is it specifically that uh, uh, the cross section you can treat the divergence in the cross section but not the amplitude? Because I didn't catch that very well. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't explain that, and I think it was uh, um, it was not also explained today in the morning. Uh, usually, uh, this fact, uh, this fact that inclusive. Inclusive observables are uh, safer, or the infrared divergences is known as this KLN theorem. You probably heard key, yeah. uh, you know, Schitte, Lee, Nauenberg theorem, where they just explicitly show that this is the case. But in the context of what I said, I think when you're doing the averaging, you effectively address the electrons. So that's or whatever you address your asymptotic states. So you allow, you allow by, by adding the soft photons or integrating over soft photons, you're effectively addressing them. And so then it becomes fine. The probability is, um, the infrared divergence tells you that you cannot have a non-zero scattering between a bare electron. But when you start doing the cross-section, you effectively always integrate over the soft sectors and effectively it allows you to scatter into something which is proper. Okay, so these are the two things that I would say. But in general, there is nothing fundamental about cross section. You can discuss fine amplitudes, mm -hmm. discuss your asymptotic states. It's it's just when when we, it's just so convenient to talk about the asymptotic states, which are multi-particle, that it's it's kind of a blessing that we can talk about cross sections. We can stay with the naive asymptotic states and still get something meaningful. So okay. It's a price we pay for that. Any any other questions? Okay, let's uh, let's continue. And uh, the, the thing which I will discuss next is uh, what is known as a signal model. And uh, it's a it's a toy model where which is uh, convenient to come back. When you when you start having doubts uh, about the more complicated questions and uh, play with it and develop some solutions, so I think it's useful to discuss it and again um, this is the so. Let's reiterate that what we are interested in in this, uh, what we are interested in here, we have some S matrix operators that allows us to take uh, some initial states of particles to the final states of particles. And one uh, uh, important thing is that, well, when we uh, so here in this operator, it knows everything about the dynamics of the whole space time. And so when we experience uh, space time in the everyday life, uh, it's very different from that. And uh, in particular, we have a clear uh, notion of the light cone, future and the past, things tend to be causal most of the time. Uh, but when we talk about the S matrix, there is no space time. So, so space time has already gone here. And the uh, space time is emergent. So this is one. And by, by this, I mean that there is no, this is a, the object which is defined through its asymptotic states. And uh, so in ADS-CFT, this is also very explicit where the, 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 the whole bulk is an emergent, this is an emergent notion. And therefore, if you ask something, uh, something like, what is, uh, what is causality? In 
adjustment of trace theory. This is not a, this is not an obvious question, and uh, in fact, it's also not an obvious question because when we when we talk about causality, we want to talk about some light cone and have some sharp sharp signals, but quantum particles are not are entities which do not like be localized so much. So in general, while we have a clear understanding what is uh, say causality in, in the classical field theory, in the S magic theory, it's it's much more subtle. And in fact, I think it's fair to say that we do not really have a good answer to this question in a complete generality. If we take uh, some gravitational or even uh, quantum mechanical S matrix and we, we, uh, we look at the most general amplitude, <clears throat> it hasn't been um, fully explored. But in some cases, we believe we do have an answer to this question. And uh, and uh, the context in which we you know, think seem to understand things better is uh, um, say this context so two to two scattering and uh, to, to go from two to two scattering to the signal what is known as a signal model you might you might think of this uh, this process as a propagation through a medium but the whole space time. You can think of it with a particle and it as a medium. So you have a medium. This, let's say you take this particle, it's a medium. And this guy is a signal propagating the medium. And then the S matrix is a, this is a cartoon. So if it's, it's, it's not super clear, don't worry. Hopefully it will slowly become very clear. So then the idea is that if you want to discuss causality, maybe we should let's first discuss something much simpler where we have the, the black box, which is created by this particle at some medium, and we have an incoming signal. And we have an outgoing signal. So uh, then uh, for simplicity, let me consider a situation where the incoming signal, it's just some classical function. You, you can think of it as actual, actual signal you sent, or then we can discuss how to model it with particles, but think for the moment, I have some inco incoming function, which, which is related say to the wave function of this particle. Then it passes through the space time and we detect the outgoing signal. And now uh, we want to understand what, uh, what are the conditions on this black box such that it's causal, whatever, analytic and unitary. What does it imply? And uh, first of all, let me let me write a model, the toy model. And in this toy model, it's going to, I, I'm taking that the, the response is linear. And the, the outgoing signal is integral. Uh, this is a you wish a definition of this model. That's just a, what I postulate this model to be. Now, uh, this fact that I'm taking the S matrix, this S operator S to be depending only on the difference is related to translation invariance of our space time. If we collide particles now, or we can collide them in one hour, it doesn't matter. Uh, so here, similarly, we believe I take the, the outgoing signal only caring about the, the differences of times, not about the overall shift of time. Well, this is related to energy conservation. Now, uh, what is uh, in this model? What is causality? What, what do we? Well, causality is simply that. Imagine that f in c prime is zero, or c prime less than zero. Then 
the signal, the incoming signal starts at say zero uh, and positive times. So then we, we expect that out G is zero for the negative times. So the, there is no, if you send a signal, the outgoing signal does not appear before the incoming signal. That's what we can call a uh, causal response. And uh, if we go to the, if we take this, take this operator and we can write it, let me write it in Fourier space. So I take now this difference. Write it like this. Um, And uh, this model then in Fourier space take a, take the form that you simply get the convolution becomes a product. This is the, the model we, we consider. And uh, if we look at the If you look at the, the opposite the Fourier space representation, it's just this. Now the, the statement of causality is a statement which we formulated there. And you see that we translate to the fact that in fact this integral does not go from minus infinity, it goes from zero. In other words, the non-zero response, this function s, is zero when uh, the time difference is negative. This is just guarantees us that the outgoing signal does not appear earlier than before. So that's this is. Now we see that uh, uh, if we have this, if we have this function, if we have this uh, function f s of omega, we can analytically continue to the upper half plane. So if I take omega and I continue it to omega plus gamma, then this phase. Um, then and therefore this integral uh, this integral converges really well if uh, at infinity because this guy decays exponentially and therefore you can just take this function th this this formula with, uh, you, you can analytically continue to now and uh, and this is just uh, uh, because so in the upper half plane means that this is positive. This is the upper half plane. And uh, this guy is positive because of causality. So we see that uh, this is a, the most famous instance which you will uncover where causality Here we here for this model we we find that the causal causal as matrices are analytic. Equivalently, we can we can uh, write the original S of omega as uh, the boundary or as a, as a continuation from the upper 
a plane, so we can take zero function in our half plane. So this is uh, sometimes it's called high epsilon description. You often see it for, um, uh, for the amplitudes, but here in this context, it's simply the statement that we see that causality is related to analyticity and uh, analyticity here. Actually, there is a question on the chat yeah. whether there is physical justification for introducing uh, I gamma. No, it's just uh, it's just an observation that it's true that yes, so one important point that I will let me make this digression now. So if we take if we take this expression, so uh, if we take this amplitude, this amplitude was will be say some function of uh, well usually c minus star s and t, but effectively energy and angle. And energy is the same as omega here, effectively. And of course, if you do the experiment, if you're experimentalist, you do not, your energy and angle are always real. And you perform the experiments to study this function for uh, real energies and angle. But one of the, one of the great discoveries in the subject was that in fact, you can complexi complexify both. And it's uh, much more powerful to think about both energy and angle as being complex parameters of which there is an experimental uh, section exists when they're both real. And so why, why is that natural thing to do is uh, exactly the first instance of this we see here is that the, the, the object which we're dealing with is causal and therefore it's just naturally analytic in upper half plane. So it's, you don't have to consider the complex gamma, but you see that it's just that the object we are dealing with because of causality, it's an analytic function in, in, in the upper half plane. So at this point, uh, it's simply a observation that uh, causality implies analyticity in the upper half plane. So uh, I would say that yes, causality justifies going to the, to the upper half plane. You see that if we would try to do it with opposite sign, we cannot do it really because the integral is blowing up. So it doesn't make sense. But in upper half plane, this is a dumping factor. So if this converged, then this will even converge much better. So, uh, yes. Now, an interesting fact. That you might you might ask is uh, the following the question. Is analyticity in the upper of plane sufficient for causality? Example, function, which is I. So, yes, sorry, uh, it's just it's from this argument, it's clear that it's necessary. If you have a causal S matrix, they're analytic enough for up, up, upper half plane. So, this establishes this error causality to analyticity but the question is if it's analytic in upper half plane is it necessarily causal and the, the answer to this question is no and uh, as an example or as an exercise you can take the following as matrix the e to the i alpha on the cube or you can take more generally um let me call it s3 and uh, you can you can 
obviously, if we continue omega in upper half plane, this is an entire function. So it's analytic. However, uh, you're welcome to check. I and mean, this is an exercise that if you plug it into the formula, uh, you can pick some incoming signals and you should observe that the outgoing signals will violate causalities which will come out before the incoming signal. So therefore, when we talk about causality, okay, analyticity is related. So the logic was here again, what I said, I told you that uh, something which is obvious about or something crucial about space-time that if we have a causal structure, we have a light cone, but in the S-matrix theory, we do not have a space-time things that uh, the states are symptotic particles. So you might ask, how does uh, causality manifest itself? Uh, and the answer is that causality manifests itself through analyticity. And uh, therefore, that's uh, maybe the deep reason why when we talk about the scattering amplitudes, it is often convenient to think not this about the real numbers, but both of them as being complex. And uh, indeed, so even I don't remember who said it, it was one of the greatest discovery of uh, the subject was discovered the complex plane. Well, in fact, there are two complex planes. And this is a, let me just drop this comment that very often at the university we study uh, complex analysis and functions of one complex variables. But you see that here naturally we have two variables, energy and angle. So it's just given four dimensions, we have energy and we have angle. Therefore, from what I said, naturally you would think that the, the, the relevant theory is a, is a theory of two complex variables and you will be right. And uh, uh, at least in my undergraduate courses, there were no such, such theory. And in fact, the theory of two complex variables is very different from the theory of one complex variable. So I think it would be in the 50s and the 60s, this was a part of the curriculum, everyone knew that. I think it's good to reintroduce it to the curriculum of physicists and study the functions of this two complex variables and complex analysis, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, okay, so if, if is uh, this uh, thing, is uh, not um, sufficient. What is sufficient? Like, how does how does this example fail here? Well, they fail very simple. Let's say we want causality is a statement that uh, for negative t. So let me say set t to something negative. This, this would be zero. This is again the same statement of itself. So let's try to do that. There. Get this uh, how do we get the zero well we let's do the same thing we have a one-dimensional integral we can deform the contour of integration so let's uh, uh, consider instead integral like this and here by shifting omega by by omega we again introduce this factor Now, you see that if we set start sending, and because this guy is analytic, we can deform in the upper half plane. So we can deform as far as we go, as, 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 we, as, as we want. And if we send, if we send gamma to infinity and this thing goes to zero, we recover zero. Because indeed, this guy for any t grows, it decays like exponential. And if this S of omega decays slower, the whole thing goes to zero. And you see, this is exactly the failure mode of this example. If you, if you plug here omega plus i gamma, you will find that in the upper half plane, it, it grows faster than exponential. 
And therefore, you cannot conclude that this is zero. And uh, I, I hope it was clear. Was it clear here, at least, what, what happened? So we are trying to check. So I told you that uh, we have causality implies analyticity. However, I claim that analyticity is not enough. So now I'm trying to elaborate on that and say, okay, well, what is causality? Causality is here is again sustaining that this operator is zero for negative times. And uh, we're trying to recover it. So how do we do that? We start with this formula and we deform the contour in the upper half plane. And then we see that indeed we can do this thing, this product will go to zero as long as this S does not grow faster is sub-exponential. If this guy goes to zero, then we recover zero. So we see that to go backwards, to go from analyticity to uh, from analyticity to causality, we need an extra condition, and this extra condition is sub-exponential growth. Um, so analyticity. Plus, uh, plus sub exponential growth. Plane plus sub exponential growth is a statement that the limit. So for any for any t. Limit gamma goes to infinity of s minus gamma. So that's uh, uh, that's how. And uh, again, in the toy model, you see it's uh, very some something is very simple, <clears throat> but this is also a general topic in the in the area of scattering amplitudes. So if you want to do a non-perturbative analysis of an amplitude, when you get an amplitude, you ask yourself, first of all, where this amplitude is analytic. And second, you ask yourself, how does it behave in the complex plane? And uh, you often hear, you, <clears throat> you might encounter, and uh, well, you definitely encounter when you uh, compute uh, Finding diagrams, but also you might encounter in the books and in the papers the statement that the scattering amplitudes are polynomially bounded. Polynomially bounded means that if you take, you go say in some complex direction, they are less than some. Power n. So this is, as you see, this is stronger. This is uh, stronger than that, but, um, but mostly related. But you see that uh, this polynomial boundedness, uh, it is not something that comes out of causality. This is what comes out of causality. And in fact, in the if you go to the papers on axiomatic quantum field theory, usually this this property is related to what is known as the temperedness. Uh, of Whiteman functions. And this temperedness of Whiteman function is an axiom. So recently, this axiom was related to, uh, say, in the context of CFT to the CFT axioms. But I just wanted to say that this polynomial boundedness of amplitudes is something quite, quite subtle. And in fact, even for the Whiteman functions, why is it tempered? And, uh, and, and also, it, it's something subtle. So instead of uh, just postulating it related to temperedness, we will continue and we will see that, in fact, uh, this property, uh, it emerges naturally when we combine causality and unitarity. And this will be our next step. So what is, uh, uh, what is unitarity? Such as saying that uh, the uh, polynomial boundness uh, emerges when you use uh, 
causality unitarity, but by assuming also polynomial boundness or even without that? Uh, no, I, I'm. I, I, well, now polynomial boundedness will emerge from from unitarity. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From the exponential. Yes. Now, uh, I guess one interesting question is is um, uh, maybe it's probably confusing for 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 students, but let me make this comment that um, okay, let me not make this comment. Okay. Okay, so uh, now let's introduce the notion of uh, of unitarity. So as we discussed today in the morning in the context of scattering amplitudes, it was a conservation of probability, which we can think in the context of, some of a signal model as a fact that probability being some kind of norm, that if we take a uh, signal, outgoing signal, It should be less or equal than the norm incoming signal. Now again, I'm just stating this as my definition of unitarity, but this can be naturally related to the relativistic. So here, what I just Told you I introduced the notion of unitarity, which is a statement that when we when we send the signal through the black box, so we are we are considering the relativistic space times with particles and them are a very special type of black box. First of all, they are causal, and second, they are unitary. In other words, if you send the particle, uh, your probability to detect the particle as the result of the particle could be strictly less only than the less or equal than the probability, say less than one. Because uh, you can also, instead of uh, coming out as a particle, decay into some other particle, create some other things. So, but uh, unitarity tells us that if you think of this as probability, that if the prob probability to stay stays the same is less or equal than the original one. But we can with this we can always just normalize to one. So, in other words, uh, I'm saying that let's say you have some space time and you shoot the particle through the space time. And you ask what's the probability to detect it back? It's less than one, less or equal than one. It's one if it's elastic scattering, and if it's an elastic scattering, it will be less than one. So now, what is the question? What is the uh, the the outcome of this of this thing? Well, let me state the result. The result is that. S of omega is less or equal than one on in the upper half plane. Now you see is this is uh, uh, this is the same. This is related to this with n equals zero. If I set in this formula n equals zero, and I think of this in upper half plane, this is precisely precisely this. So uh, let's see let's see how it is how to show that. For this purpose, let me take uh, an incoming signal. You know, which is just hole in the lower half plane, the pure hole. 
and uh, in the coordinate space, it is uh, this is time. And it has a theta function, so it starts at equal zero. Then it has a normalization parser such that you can check if you want. Let's start with the signal. And we now write down um, write down the entirety. So uh, well, first of all. That um, you can rewrite using whatever it's called Parseval's identity is the same, the same inequality in a, in a Fourier space. So uh, the equivalence of this the inequality this type of inequality it also falls in Fourier space, and uh, we can now consider the following thing. So. Let's consider how uh, square. So this is what we want. And uh, by causality, it's something like this. This is just the definition. Of this thing. Now, uh, if we think of this, uh, if we think of this as a scalar product, which is defined as you know, f of t times t of t integrated from zero to infinity, we can use uh, the fish words identity to bound it like this. And here so this is a shush word. Here. Uh, and uh, here we use uh, we, we use uh, this is precisely the norm, and we can uh, use uh, we will use unitarity. And for this integral, if imagine that we consider omega to be some complex omega, so then this uh, integral will be simply e to the minus two x part omega. T because the phase the real part cancels, and so we get uh, this thing is one over twice imaginary part omega. Out. And now uh, we use uh, unitarity, which says that the norm of the out is less than the norm of in, which is one. So we arrive at the Conclusion that this is less than twice imaginary. And 
So now we simply uh, take the absolute value of s of omega, which is what we want to bound. And if you remember by definition, what's the ratio outgoing signal incoming signal? And uh, now we use that, that this is less than twice the imaginary part. So we get this. And now you can check, you consider the incoming signal, and we evaluate it at omega equal equals omega zero plus i gamma. So we plug it here. This cancels. These two adds up. Cancel the square root, and uh, so we get. One over two gamma, and therefore this inequality becomes S of omega zero plus i gamma square less or equal than this produce square produce two gamma, and this is also two gamma, so it's one. So we prove. Now you take omega zero and gamma whatever you want. So we have proven this property. Yeah. Um, but the statement is that this is the, if I read the inequality before we input the F in, we decided statement is that for any input signal, we will have the inequality satisfied. Uh, is this yeah. the minimal bound we can put or? So, uh, the statement is that this is a statement that it's uh, true for uh, any signal. Yeah. And now, yes, I have shown to you uh, that this is definitely true. Mm -hmm. By choosing some signals, you can ask, uh, you can better. Okay. And uh, I haven't shown that, but I think the answer should be no. Um, okay. yes. But uh, you're right that I haven't, I showed that this implies that, but I haven't shown that. Otherwise, but it, I think it, it might be. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's uh, uh, another another topic, which is that in uh, so here, as I showed that that by by putting in unitarity, we uh, we found that the amplitude does not grow. Say in the upper half plane, and uh, in the context of scattering amplitudes, again it's the same story. You have a bound from causality, and then when you put in unitarity, you put a bound on the growth of the amplitudes, and this is eventually becomes what's known as a cross R bound. So it will be again the same topic where we take the, the and then the cross R bound or optical which is related to the optical theory mentioned in today's morning lecture. Which you put some non-perturbative bond on the growth of the cross section. So, okay, now let me say something, which is um, exercise again. Imagine that. Take S of omega to be one plus I C omega P some power and uh, plus some fractions. So this is some perturbative test matrix, which at low energies say looks like this. So check that. The fact this this implies uh, e less or equal than one, and sometimes it is known as a bound and chaos.
And moreover, check that say t equals one is real. And uh, if you take this maximally, so bound of chaos or it's called like that. And uh, if you take this maximally, maximally, so if, if you wish it's a bound on the growth of the amplitude with energy, growth on the S matrix with energy. And uh, there is a famous theory which such writes this. And this is uh, this is a Einstein theory of gravity. So in particular, if you consider scattering of two, two particles, if you have one particle and you have another particle, then when you go through this other particles, you experience a Shapiro delay. This is now a typical scattering, and uh, the relation to signal model, you prepare some wave packet uh, along the light form direction, and then you propagate say, with the speed of light, with a large speed, and you see that what, what we meant by a causality is a signal cannot come out here. This was that we said that if I prepare the signal somewhere here, that it cannot come out here, and indeed in all physical theories, it it does not come out here because then you will you will jump inside a light cone. And uh, the S matrix of propagating of scattering of two particles is just a fact of light. If you have a gravitational scattering two to two, this S matrix, which if you think of this as a propagation for some medium, it looks like this. So, and this statement is the statement of Shapiro delay. And the fact that it's uh, you know positive. Is uh, in fact it's real and and it's positive. This is exactly realized in uh, theory of gravity. Now, uh, okay, so far we have discussed uh, causality and analyticity. We have discussed unitarity. Um, so now. You can ask, what is the what is the relation of the signal model to the actual relativistic scattering? So, And in general, it's it's a it's a subtle it's a subtle relation because uh, as as you see now, if you think of a of the setup like this where we prepare wave packets, then first of all, uh, I was considering in in my in, in my presentation the frequencies were both positive and negative, and uh, this was fine for signals, but for particles they just carry positive energy. So there is, if you go, if you want to go from particles to um, from this signal model to particles, there is seems to be a there is a tension because the particle has only positive energy, and uh, well, one way you you can uh, you can deal with this is by considering some kind of coherent states. Indeed. Uh, you can consider, imagine that you have some field uh, instead of talking about the particle, we can consider some kind of excitation of the type. So the field and the exponent and act on the vacuum. And indeed, uh, you can uh, convince yourself if you have, if you consider these coherent states and you formulate and you go through the exercise, you recover this signal model. Uh, this uh, you can find in the notes, but uh, this is a little bit maybe too exotic. Let me uh, comment on uh, what we don't want maybe in this lecture in this lectures to talk about coherent states. I guess it's, it's good to, to have a connection of this type with this simple signal model, but what about uh, two to two 
Chat right now, please. And uh, then, uh, can we relate it to that? So here, what you can consider to connect to this analysis is uh, this S matrix, which is unitary as a function of energy. This is a Mandelstam energy, which we can think as roughly being energy of this particle, omega times the energy of that particle, omega prime. And let's consider it in the impact parameter space. So we uh, look at, um, at the scattering of these wave packets. You can imagine there are the slight form directions. There is also a transverse plane, and you can isolate them um, with some um, impact parameter P is prepared to wave packets separated by distance B, and you can see this pattern. And then, uh, indeed, you, you can do it with, uh, well, with pions as well. It doesn't matter, pions, gravitons, whatever you want. You take this object. Excuse me, Sasha, can you explain a little bit more this drawing? This is referred to what you yeah. had before of the S matrix as a scattering of the background, right? Yeah. And now the background. Background is so. Let me. This is the medium. So the background is just this particle, and this is a signal. And then, uh, you know, if you're sitting far away, you don't care what is this medium, you just send something in and you pick something out. And so then uh, you can measure the profile of the field in the beginning. This is the incoming signal, and you measure it. Also, this is F out. Now, uh, Uh, if you look, if you look at this process in any physical theory, you will find that okay, now this uh, omega, which we discussed, is related to Mandelstam S. You will find that indeed, as we discussed, that uh, the causality implies that the thing is analytic here, so it's analytic in number of plane. And uh, indeed, there is a here when omega is positive and it's related to scattering of particle. There's this picture there. Indeed, it's less than one. It's less than equal than one. And this will be the expression of unitarity that this is a. Uh, but however, what you find in the relativistic case, when you try to connect to a signal model, that there is also this region, which is omega less than zero. And this region, it does not have an interpretation of this type because this particle has a positive energy. And in fact, it's related to what is known as scattering in a cross channel. We will discuss it more. And therefore, there is no there is no condition like that. So we don't we don't really know if it's less than one or not. And therefore, you see that this is a first example where okay, we develop a a, a, a nice model which works really nicely. And in fact, uh, people use effectively people use this this constraint. Uh, to bound effective field theories. For example, you can try to write a theory, gravitational theory, add corrections to that. And then you see that if you start violating this, 
you can build coherent states and and run up the experiment and violate the causality and exclude effective field theories like that. So this was already useful. Now, if you want to do it cleanly at the level of two to two scattering amplitude, you run into the struggle that you have your particles carrying positive energy before for me only goes like a field. This and uh, a priori you, you seem like okay now all this can, all these conclusions that we uh, that we had from this model go away. But on the other hand, we know from coherent state that they're reasonable. And in fact, uh, uh, very recently, maybe this year even, people, people understood how to, how to go about this problem and how to really to translate this sort of derivations to the two to two scattering amplitudes. And the new ingredient that goes into here is crossing. And uh, I haven't discussed that, but this is what the extra ingredient in relativistic scattering, which, uh, uh, which will allow us to solve, uh, to solve this problem later in the lectures. Finally, let me make another little comment just to, just to have it written. When we talk about relativistic theories, and uh, I mentioned causality, uh, we usually mean two things. So one is what is known as microcausality. This is something in my And here, this is a statement about local operators. Two local operators. Um, then so they should commute. X minus y square is space length. Depending on the signal positive and negative. So this is what to say that the measurement here cannot affect. The measurement, which is space like separated, some perturbation of Hamiltonian at one point cannot affect the space like measurement. However, you see again that uh, here is the tension, this tension which I mentioned is incredibly sharp, is that the causality is best formulated in terms of local operators, operators which are infinitely localized and this commute outside the light form. However, as matrix theory, when we consider scattering, we are talking about. Uh, um, scattering of particles and particles they are not localized entities. In fact, they you know the, the wave function spreads, and uh, therefore people also. It, it, in fact, in the, in, the, in, the, in the past, it took people quite some work to start from this and to derive something about the um, properties of the amplitude. But sometimes. So you can do it in QCD, for example, or some quantum field theory. We have uh, we have local operators, but in some case, for example, if we have gravity, we don't even have that uh, because there are no local operators in, in gravitational theory. And then uh, the idea is that we still have some macro causality, which is a statement that if I want to communicate with some neighboring galaxy. Even if I use gravitons for this, they will still propagate with the speed of light. I can set, encode my message in, in some gravity wave, but it will still take uh, take time to, to propagate. And uh, this fact that the signals cannot be can only be sent by say on shell particles, and uh, so the fastest the fastest we can send the signal in the our universe is by sending an on shell particle, which is say massless. Uh, this has been analyzed for gap theories, but even for, for massless theories, uh, as far as I know, this has not been analyzed. But in both cases, uh, in both cases, you conclude that starting from this or that, when you go from the statements to amplitudes, you get you always come to some region of analogies.
So this connection between causality and analogicity it is it is there. So Francesco, that's probably a good point to it's perfect. Yeah. Okay, I, I can stop here and I will uh, continue. Well, we'll have a discussion and now next lecture will continue with uh, relativistic kinematics and really build into two to two scattering amplitudes and we will develop tools for it, but the, the main players, causality and analyticity, analyticity, unitarity, and we will add crossing, they will be there. And then we will try to build more based on that. Thank you.